And so we pick up here in verse 26, where it says, And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwelling. From one blood. From one blood. In other words, we all came from Adam through Noah. Of course, you know the whole story there with Noah and So we came from Adam and then through Noah because a result of the flood and all. Now, although we are all one blood, physically speaking, we'll get back to that. Although we are all one blood, physically speaking, man, woman, of varying color, from different ethnic backgrounds and everything, even though we are of one blood, we have varying boundaries in this world. God determined those boundaries to be. We see the world today trying to unite But uniting apart from Christ is forbidden from God. God set boundaries. Whether it's, like I remember in the 80s, you know, the song, We Are the World, and we see one world globalism and the push of that these days. We know that that will play into the hands of the Antichrist. But God set boundaries to be. Different nations and all. It's interesting that those who have issues, even when we talk about boundaries, speaking about, you know, we've got the whole political debate over the wall, the southern wall. But you go around the world today and, you know, there's, the Great Wall of China. You go into Israel today and you see exceedingly high walls that they are building that are uh, separating uh, them there from uh, other parts. And you see these walls in varying areas. Most likely we have walls that surround our home. It says, this is the boundary of my property we have what's called a property line. And if I started planting an olive tree 10 feet beyond my property line, I can guarantee you I will hear of it. And it will end up being removed one way or the other because there are boundaries. It's interesting that on a political level, those that that don't like boundaries... And walls have walls. Nancy Pelosi, who talks about those things, has a wall around her property. The Pope has a massive massive walls around the Vatican and all. Yet they say no walls, and they themselves have walls. Boundaries are perfectly fine. It's interesting to just take note of those things. But Israel has boundaries. And those boundaries are set by God. And I want you to understand something here. God set the boundaries for Israel. It's not David Ben-Gurion. Back in 1948, in May of 1948, he did not set the boundary. It's not Benjamin Netanyahu or anyone else. It's God who sets the boundaries. Now, I will explain a little something here. Here is, in part, the problem when we talk about boundaries. We've got the boundary of of Israel today, just a sliver of a nation about the size of Rhode Island or so. You know, it's just so tiny. You know that they have never 
taken control of all of the land that God gave them. They've never taken possession of all of it, only a portion of it. When you read in the Old Testament, the portion of land is actually far greater than what they have. You remember, come on now, the, the conquest of Canaan. And you've got Joshua, the son of Nun, and, and the Israelites, and, they, and they're going in and they're taking the land. Yes, and kind of not. They've taken only part of the land. And then they got comfortable. They got comfortable, and they didn't take any more. The world today and Israel today, and because of Israel, the world today is reeling with the effects of what the Israelites failed to do in the conquest of Canaan. And the conquest all those years ago. As a result, the enemy has risen up taken arms. Today, rockets were coming across the border into Israel, and Israel had to deal with that again. If Israel would have dealt with the issue thousands of years ago, they would not be where they're at today, I propose. Boundaries. God gave them boundaries, and they said, we're going to take less than that. Just think about that thing. Those who oppose these things find themselves opposing God. Boundaries. There's boundaries for the sea, you know. The sea has a boundary. Did you ever wonder what keeps it where it is? Why doesn't it just go further? Why not? In Proverbs chapter 8, verse 27 through 29, if you look on the screen, <clears throat> It says, I was there when he set the heavens in place, and when he marked out the horizon on the face of the deep, when he established the clouds above and fixed securely the fountains of the deep, when he gave the sea its boundary, so the waters would not overlap his command, and when he marked out the foundations of the earth. So God marked out the foundations of the earth. God gave the sea its boundaries that it would not overstep his command. That it goes, hey, I appreciate on those occasions that I can go to Pacific Beach, down there in San Diego, I appreciate, and we stay on the beach, we stay at a hotel on the beach because our favorite thing is just to it's just to enjoy what God has made. And that's what we go for. It's just to enjoy the you know, simplicity you know, of God's creation and, and uh, just to pray and worship and just enjoy one another. And it's just a good thing. But I appreciate the fact that God keeps the boundary where he keeps it. Can you imagine if one day he didn't? Ah, you know, <laughs> be kind of scary. It's God who does these things. Paul's declaring you don't set boundaries. These kinds of boundaries, they're set by God. God does and we must worship him as he is, because he is. Man needs boundaries. Mankind needs direction and order and laws and rules. Man needs these things. I believe when we're talking even in the looser sense just for just a moment here about boundaries, I believe that God has so much more for each and every one of us just as he has for Israel, okay, who has not taken possession of all of the boundary that God set. I believe that we have not taken possession of all of the boundaries that God has set for us as his people. I believe that we live below those boundaries. We like it at times status quo, simple, easy, 
Well, I'm, I'm happy and content with this. You'll be even happier and blessed in with what God has for you. Can you imagine what it would be like? What it would be like if we actually prayed and meant and worked towards, Lord, I want to receive and enjoy all that you have for me. Look, now, listen, if it comes from God, you're going to love it. Every good and perfect gift comes from Him. If it comes from Him, His people will love it. But what happens? We get distracted. It's good enough. The first part of verse 27 says, so that they should seek the Lord. So that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for Him and find Him. So no matter our boundaries, we are all of the same human blood. We are all a part of His creation. And we are all to seek Him as well as live and move or conduct ourselves in Christ. But we know that all do not. We know that most do not. And so we're to worship him in truth. Now, if we don't worship him in truth, then we're worshiping him in a lie. I get people knocking at my door that want to convert me into something that is not biblical, proven truth. They're worshiping a lie. It's dangerous. If we're not worshiping him in truth, we're worshiping him in a lie, and therefore we are not worshiping him at all. Don't be deceived. So then based on these verses, man has no excuse is what it's saying. There's no excuse. Turn, if you would, to Romans, the book of Romans, chapter 1. There's one book over. The book of Romans, go to your right, chapter 1. And if you're taking notes, verses 18 through 25, it says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has, listen, shown it to them. Verse 24, Since the creation of the world. So this is something observable, okay? Since the creation We walk around, we're all part of his creation. Since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen. So his invisible attributes, we clearly, mankind clearly can see, being understood by the things that are made. So we understand by what is made, the one who is not made. Are you with me? We understand when we look at what is made, it speaks of a what? maker. Creation speaks of a creator. Art speaks of an artist, okay? His invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. So everyone in all of creation, there is no excuse. That's what it's saying. Doesn't Scripture say that the heavens declare the glory of God? Yes, it does. We are all without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify Him as God, nor were they thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image. And this is what they were doing there in Athens, in Greece. These images and these false gods, and these Greek gods and mythology and all. They profess to be wise. 
Remember, there were the Stoic philosophers that we read about last week and the Epicurean philosophers that we read about last week. Different types. I'm not going to go over that again. Learned men, educated men, but did not know God. Learned and educated men in religiosity, but did not know God who created them. How sad is that? They became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were dark. And professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. Therefore, in other words, as a result of this, God gave them up to uncleanness in the lusts of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator who is forever blessed. Amen. If man seeks God, surely he will find him. Those that don't find God, rest assured, it's because they did not seek him. If you seek, Scripture says you will find. Now, the second part of verse 27 and into verse 29 says, He is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as also some of our own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Therefore, in light of these things, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, something shaped by art and man's devising. God laid it out and made it so simple. It is throughout the Word, Old and New Testament alike. No graven image, no idols. Paul goes on to say that because he is not far from each one of us, therefore we live in him. So the apostle is saying that God has made man in his image. We see that back in uh, the first chapter there, or in the, in the book, rather, I mean, of Genesis. God has made man in his image. And so it's ridiculous to say that man can make gods in our image. God's made man in his image. And what does man do? We make gods in our image. It's really pretty dumb. I just don't know how else to say it. It's just pretty dumb. In many ways, man has modernized that. We've modernized it and wrapped it up and put a nice bow on the package and we've modernized it to today. Oh yes, there's still those statues and images, whether, whether we see in, we'll just say the Catholic Church as an example, or in Buddhism as another example, or we can use all kinds of examples. You get the point though. But in many, many ways, man has modernized this whole thing. Man may bow to the image of, what do they call it? The almighty dollar. Which is really weird because it's not, your dollar isn't even really worth a dollar. It's not really worth the paper that it's printed on, but that's for another day, I guess. Man will bow to physical beauty. There's not a check stand that you don't go to in any grocery store that doesn't have cosmopolitan and all these women that have been airbrushed. They don't even really look like that in real, you know? We all look the same when we wake up in the morning, you know? Hair is sticking up like here and, you know, and all this kind of stuff. We all, you know? They make them look perfect and all that. Men, men's magazines and, and all that kind of stuff, you know, men's health and everything. Everybody looks perfect and looks wonderful and everything. And it's the worship of the body. The worship of those things. The worship of physical beauty. How about the God of 
excessive materialism. That's America for you. The God of excessive materialism. They were there, Paul was, and there were all of these different gods that were there. But now here we are today. What gods would Paul find today? Some of these gods that we're talking about, he would find today. How about the image of position or fame, perhaps the God of excessive entertainment and so on. God is who he is, and he is to be worshipped. We are not to be worshipped, and we are not to worship any other. Do you worship him? Where do we spend the lion's share of our time? Where is our mind thinking on? He has revealed himself, the second person of the Trinity and the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus received worship. He said that there is no other way to God. We may recall, by the way, going back into the Old Testament, the golden calf, that whole incident, that was a mess. Even Aaron, the high priest, was caught up in that. Rather delusional he was, you know. Sin makes you stupid. It didn't go so well. Verses 30 through 31, it says, Truly these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. Because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. And he has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. Charles Spurgeon said, so it is not left optional to you whether or not you will accept the gospel. He said, it is not said to you, you may, if you will, accept it, or you may, if you please, reject it. You cannot reject it without incurring the guilt of disobedience to a divine command. Well said. Don't mistake the long-suffering of God for apathy. Again, truly these times of ignorance, God overlooked. The long-suffering of God, the patience of God. God is a patient God. Man oftentimes is fooled. Something didn't happen this time. I'm good to go. I don't know. Man thinks, mankind thinks God didn't notice. or God knows everything. He knows the thoughts and intents of the heart. He knows what you're thinking right now. He knows your intents. He knows what you're going to do. You think you're going to do this, and you, and you say, I'm, no, God, God I'm, I'm going to do this. Remember Peter? Oh, no, God, no, 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 I'll never, I'll never deny you. I won't deny you. I won't deny you. What did Peter do? What did Jesus say? You're going to deny me. This is how it's going to go down. No, 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 not me. Not me, Lord. I'm your guy. I'm your man. What did he do? He denied him. And when he saw Christ across the, across the courtyard, what did Peter do? When he heard the, the rooster and he saw Christ, what did he do? It says not only did he weep, it says he wept bitterly. I would have thought I should have listened. I didn't listen. I thought I knew me better, but he knows me all too well. You know what the best way is to know you? If you want to know you, really know who you are, the best way to know you is to get in God's Word. He'll reveal. The Word of God is a mirror to the heart of man. I can't see my heart. That'd be kind of creepy anyhow, but I can't see my heart, but, but, but I can see it in the mirror of God's Word. That's how we'll know ourselves better, you know. It's a revealer. 
his word is. <clears throat> but don't mistake in the long suffering of God for apathy. God is just and will bring justice. He will bring justice. Therefore, judgment is required because he is just. And because he will bring justice, judgment is required and all will be judged by God. All will be judged. We read in the word about the judgment of those who have received him and the judgment of those who have rejected him. Those who have received him, they are judged unto rewards for what we did with Christ. Those who rejected him will be judged unto condemnation and eternal punishment and separation from God for all eternity. Two judgments. Why are those in Christ judged to rewards and not judged to any condemnation? Because he took our sins upon him. We put our trust and faith in Jesus Christ unto salvation. All our sins were imputed to him. In essence, we said, Lord, I don't want to, nor can I, pay for my own sins. And he willingly went to the cross to pay for them for you and I. For those in Christ. For those not in Christ, their sin is upon their own head. And they will bear the weight of that for all eternity. For those in Christ, our sin is not upon our head. Our sin was upon Christ. And he paid for the sin of you and of me. He said to the Father, it's finished. Three days later, he rose from the grave. We can be set free. How wonderful that really is, you know. So he commands repentance. No, not a goody two shoes life in Tibet. That's not repentance. You know, thinking about, uh, you know, right down the street from the hotel that we stay in in San Diego, uh, and walking distance down the street, you know is um, this temple, you know, uh, Eastern, you know, kind of, a, kind of a thing and all. And, and it's got the temple priests that come out of there and they come and, and walk the, the boardwalk there, you know. Um, they're dressed in that, that orangey kind of, you know, garb that they wear. And they've got this interesting kind of I don't know what you want to call it, uh, you know, like a little drummer boy kind of, you know, drum thing as they're walking. And it's, and it's uh, you know, sounds like, you know, the headhunters from the jungle are coming to get you, you know. And, boop, 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 you know, it's just kind of weird and creepy. And they got some creepy kind of little dance thing that they do. And, you know, you'll see a couple of them and they'll be together and they'll go down one way and down another way. And, you know, they're, they're doing that whole thing and they've, they're denying themselves, and so they, they look so incredibly simple, you know, thinking that God is pleased by their vain attempt to please Him through their simplicity. God doesn't care about the simplicity of their clothing. It doesn't make them holier. It doesn't make them holy. It's faith in Jesus Christ. It's not what you wear. It's not what you deny yourself of, you know, it's your trust and faith in Christ. And it's so sad, you know, when, you, when, when you're there and you actually see this, and I've seen it numerous times, you know, uh, down there and everything. God calls men everywhere to repentance, not just a denial of every fleshly thing. Look, one cannot repent without knowing the one that he has sinned against, can he? Repent from what and to whom? Uh, 
And one cannot know him without his written word, which proclaims him, nor call upon him without faith in him. John 20, verse 31 says, But these are written that you may believe, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. And so his word reveals him. So we're good to go. I go to church, I hear his word that reveals him, and I'm good to go. I'm, that means I'm, I'll be in heaven. Eh. No. Got to receive. You put your faith in Jesus Christ. Romans 1.17. And it says, For in it the righteousness of God is revealed, what? From faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. Those that are just before God, those that are just before a just judge, are so because of faith in Christ. And just even as Abraham, the faith is accredited unto righteousness. It's not a self-righteousness. It's a righteousness by faith in the one who is truly righteous. Turn to Romans chapter 3. Again, just one book to the right. Romans chapter 3, picking up in verse 21 through 26. But now, speaking of righteousness, the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe, for there is no difference. There is no difference, it says. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by His blood through faith to demonstrate His righteousness, because in His forbearance God has passed over or had passed over, the sins that were previously committed. Remember in the Old Testament, the Passover and all. To demonstrate at the present time His righteousness, that He might be just, now listen, and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Amazing. Roman Catholicism doesn't have that. Eastern Orthodoxy does not have that. Roman Catholic Church has 1.3 billion adherents. Something that is, is pretty close to being almost the same exact thing of Roman Catholicism is Eastern Orthodoxy. 300 million follow that. They have their own pope, by the way, as well. Both of those popes actually got together because there's this whole... Uh, uh, schism, you know, between the two, they got together and they, you know, kind of made peace because we see this push again to one world government, one world peace, no boundaries in anything, you know, do what you want to do, you know, that whole thing. He's the justifier, the one who has faith in Jesus. I'd like you also to turn to First Peter towards the end of your New Testament. 1 Peter chapter 4. If you're taking notes, verses 1 through 5. It says, Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind, for he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. For we have spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lewdness, lusts, drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. In regards to these, they think it strange that you do not run with them in the same flood of dissipation, speaking evil of you. 
and they will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. This is what Paul is talking about. All will give an account. Why should I let you in? You know, I mean, somebody knocks at my door. They want in my house. Why should I let you in? My children come in. In fact, my children have access. They have keys. They just walk in, you know. They have access. And they come in, and I'm like, okay, you're okay. You're good to go, you know. <laughs> no. I'm not going to take you down. If somebody else tries to come in, they got to break in. It's not going to go well. Like the Roach Motel. Roaches come in. They don't, they don't go back out the same way they came in. Okay? It's not a, it's not a good thing. You don't want to do that. Okay? Why should I come into heaven? If God were to ask a question, I'm not saying he's going to ask this question, but if he were to ask the question, why should I let you in? Why would you say, I'm a good person? Eh. No, you're not. Our best is this filthy rags. No, you're not in by your good works. Thank goodness we're not in by our good works because we're, 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 we're just not good enough because we're sinners before a righteous God. So I'm thankful that it's not by good works. But what does the religion of the world tell you? Your works. Why will you, what will you answer? You know? Hey, Jesus is my Lord. My faith is in him. My trust is in him. I've given my heart to him. I put my trust in him. You're good to go. You're good to go. Now, don't mistake in this into saying that works have no place. Because works are the outflow of true faith in Jesus Christ. One says they have faith. One says they have works. You know, show me your faith without works. You know the scripture. And, and here's the thing. And I'll show you my, 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 my faith with my works or with my good deeds. True faith is seen. Now listen, the proof is in the pudding by our works that back up the faith that we have proclaimed. If the works are not backing up that faith, then your faith is not a true faith in Jesus Christ. You know a different Jesus. It's not this Jesus of the Bible. It's a different Jesus. You know? It's a different Christ. It's not the Christ of the Bible. And so, the works are important as an outflow of true faith. How does one know that Jesus will judge the world? Because of his proven resurrection. What does he say at the end of verse 31 in chapter 17 of Acts? But that he has given assurance of this to all. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. In other words, we are proclaiming to you something that stands out from all of your false gods. The resurrection of this one called Jesus, who is the Christ. That's how we know this is true. That's how we know that he is who he is. That's how we know because he did that and because we know he did that. When he says, I'm going to judge, you know what that means? He's going to judge. So the question is, is are you ready to be judged? That's the question. If your answer right now is no, you better do something about it very quickly. Scripture says, teach us to number our days. We don't know how long we have. We all make our plans. Well, you know, I... I you know, tonight I'm going to go home and, you know, and I'm, I'm going to do this and that and, you know, kind of my, my nightly routine of things and, you know, and, and, and chocolate will probably be involved in there somewhere, but I'll do my, night, my nightly routine of things, you know. <laughs> but I've already got my idea tomorrow. It's a busy day, man. It's just lined up. It's all these different things, right? Well, I'm going to do that tomorrow. What does Scripture say? Don't say, I'm going to do this or do that, but say, if the Lord wills. 
because we're presumptuous upon God who is divine. We're presumptuous upon God who is sovereign. God may say, uh, tomorrow you're going to wake up sick because I want you on your back so you, you spend maybe extra time with me or, or any number of things, right? I accomplish something that, you know, whatever it may be. And I thought I'm going to do this or that in my presumption, presumption and pride. So be careful. Verses 32 through 34 as we wrap this up this evening. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, while others said, we will hear you again on this matter. So Paul departed from among them. However, some men joined him and believed. Among them, uh, Dionysius and uh, 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 the uh, Aropagite, a woman named Damaris, and others with them. So what do we see here in these three verses? We see three groups of people. Those that mocked him. In other words, and, and understand, they're mocking Paul, but really they're mocking God. They're mocking Paul who they see because they don't see God. But they're rep- mocking the representative of God. Does Paul take it serious? Does Paul, oh, oh, I can't do this anymore. I can't tell people about Jesus because, oh, what they might think of me, what they will say, oh, they laughed at me. No, really, they're laughing at God, you know. Okay, sticks and stones, you know, come on. Some mocked. Some said, the second group of people, well, you know what? Hmm, think about this just a little bit more, you know. We'll hear you again on this matter, you know. Um, you know, what are you doing on, you know, Tuesday evening, you know? <laughs> and then others uh, in here, some joined him and believed. They put their trust in the Lord. Isn't that what we find? We find through gr- three groups of people. Those that laugh, those that say, oh, that's ridiculous. You believe in that? I remember years ago, uh, this is probably 20 years ago, to be honest with you. It might even be longer than that now, actually. Uh, he, I remember I was working the graveyard shift, you know. And, you know, back and forth, we have opportunity. I have opportunity to witness. I always looked at uh, my employment, my jobs as, as um, um, ministry. You know, you ever pray, God, I, I, I need ministry. And, and you think you've got to go to the other side of the world to minister to people. That's ridiculous. If you can't minister to your neighbor, you think you're going to do any ministry uh, on the other side of the world that you're spending all your vacation time and all your money on? Probably not, you know. When, you, when God has given you a mission field in the workplace, a mission field while you're trying to find the perfect apple in the produce section, there's that other person, right? you know. Mission fields are all around us, okay. Don't get me wrong, I'm all for missions out there. But what about missions here? We all have a mission field around us, every one of us do. Are we putting that to use, you know? And so I'm at work and, you know, talking about the Lord, whatever I was saying that night, and literally they mock me. I mean, it was like a group of them. I, I like stand around and they're like mocking me, like, you know, I mean, like I was like, you know, I don't know, making fun of me like I'm, you know, an alien or got a third eye or something, you know, and, 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 just, and they literally said, you actually believe that stuff? The next breath, they start talking about UFOs. And aliens from other worlds and all that kind of stuff. And, and they believe that. But they don't believe in the creator like we were talking here uh, and, and in, uh, in Acts 17 and in Romans chapter 1. Oh, no, they, they don't believe that. But they believe in the green guys, you know. They laughed at me for believing in the infallible proof and truth of God's word and go on to talk about little green men coming to us in spaceships. And I thought, wow, that's what sin does to you. But you got to understand that to receive this God, not, I, I should say, to, to say that, 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 yes, he is God and, 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 and I put my trust and faith in him and what is the word of God says, hey, we're called to repentance, right? To not live like we lived before, we're not truly in him, okay? That means I got to change, and I don't want to change. Little green men don't tell me to change, but the God of all creation 
tells me to change. So I'll mock that God and say he doesn't exist, and I'll follow the little green men. It, it sounds ridiculous, but this, is, this was really what the conversation came down to, you know, 20 some odd years ago that night. And I walked away from that. I've never forgotten it. I, I just always thought it's just, it's just amazing in a sad way. So amazing. But you keep on ministering. You keep on ministering. Because some are going to laugh at you. And some are going to say, well, you know what? Yeah, it's a little busy right now. You know, we'll talk about it later. And some are going to say, you know what? I want your Jesus. I want your Jesus. I want what you have. You know? Some of you perhaps have had the opportunity, even upon the deathbed of a loved one, to give them one last opportunity to put their trust in Jesus. And some of them have. Some of them have. How amazing is that, huh? How wonderful is that? God wants to use you, oh mighty man and woman of God. God wants to use you as a missionary in our city for the gospel of grace, of faith in Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Lord, you truly are amazing, and your word is no less. Lord, you call us to this faith, to receive your gracious gift of yourself to save our souls who came to pay the price of our sin because we could not pay. Your word says to humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. So for many of us, Lord, we've come before you. We've humbled ourselves before you. Because you are God and we are not. And we come before you, Lord. Even as service began this evening, voices lifted high, hands lifted high, because you are who we worship and adore. Oh, Lord, we adore Thee. We adore Thee. We love You, Lord. Do you know this God? To the Greeks, there was that inscription there to the unknown God, and the Apostle Paul said, it is he whom I proclaim to you. That unknown God, Paul made known to them that day as being Jesus the Christ who had risen from the grave. And Lord, we see him proclaimed here this evening. Which group of people will you find yourself in tonight? Those who laughed and ridiculed. Those that said, well, I'll think about it maybe another day. Or those who put their trust and faith in Christ unto salvation. If you would like to know this Jesus, will you call upon him today? Call upon the name of the Lord and be saved. There's one way. Jesus. As we're in an attitude of prayer this evening, would you just uh, agree along with me in prayer? Perhaps you're here this evening and, and you have not made that commitment to receive Christ as Savior. Tonight you can do so. Will you agree along with me in prayer? Lord Jesus, just pray with me. Lord Jesus, I put my trust in you to save my soul. You are the Redeemer who paid for the sins of the world. 
died upon the cross and you are risen from the grave. It is you that I ask to come into my heart and make me alive in you. I will follow you from this day forward. And Lord, I turn today from my sin and turn to you. Please forgive me of my sins. Perhaps you prayed that prayer this evening. Scripture says that you are a new creation in Christ. Scripture says that you are born again, born of the Holy Spirit of God. God is charting for you a new course in this new beginning, in this journey of faith. Lord, we praise and thank you tonight. Lord, for all the rest of us, may we be your evangelists in the missionary, in the mission field that you call our city. May we proclaim Jesus and the resurrection. Lord, strengthen your church in you. Lord, we thank you, we love you, and we praise you. And we pray these things now in Jesus' precious name. And all God's church said, amen and amen. Let's all stand.